So, what I'd like to do is introduce the, uh, the thing that all NLP is based on. And this is the thing that I had that light bulb moment with. So all those years ago, first hour of a one day taster of NLP, guy at the front of the room introduced this and I had that bulb went off in my head. And I thought, oh, that's what makes people tick. That explains the difference between it. Ah, I know now what you can do about it. For me, this changed my life. No guarantees it'll change yours, but it changed my life. Uh, that's meant to be a face, by the way, if, if you haven't realized. So drawing's never been my strong suit. I always say I've not found much that NLP doesn't help with, but drawing, it's never improved. The thing is, I'm no longer embarrassed by it. So I used to be mortified at how bad I was at drawing, but now I'm, I'm no longer embarrassed at all. Uh, the only other thing that it's never worked with is uh, predicting lottery numbers. I have tried any number of times for that. It's just never, never worked. <laughs> So for me, all NLP is built on a notion of the relationship between the outside world and our inside world. Yeah? So by the outside world, I mean we're all in the same external environment right now, aren't we? We're all in this room. Yeah? Any of you not here? So we're all in the same external environment. So here's a very simple question for you, and the answer's as simple as it seems. How as human beings do we know what's going on around us in the outside world? So how, how do we know what's going on out there? And the answer is as simple as it seems. So we see some stuff. Yeah. We smell some stuff. We hear some stuff. Uh, that's, that's not about out there, that's, that's in here. So, so what's the bridge between out there and in here? So in the present moment, how do you know what's going on outside? So we touch some stuff. Hands get very difficult for me. <laughs> and with one more? And taste. And lips are even harder. When I did psychology, one of the things we, we did on, a, on the psychology degree was um, uh, we did what they call abnormal and clinical psychology. And there's a test in, there's a psychoanalytic test where you get people to draw the human form and the way they draw it apparently tells you their deepest, darkest, innermost secrets. I think I've got some really serious problems, you know. If, <laughs> if, if this is how I draw the human form, I am in deep trouble here. So the NLP line, the NLP line is the only way we know what's going on around us is through our five senses. So what we see, what we hear, what we feel, what we taste, what we smell. Some people will argue for the, that sixth sense, you know, that intuition stuff. I'm open to possibility. And I think very often what we call uh, intuition is actually stuff that we're seeing or hearing, uh, almost like out of conscious awareness. You know, it's like you notice a slight change in somebody's voice tone, slight change in facial expression, and then you can have a guess about what's going on for them. I think most of the time we take in information from the outside world, and we're actually bombarded by sensory information from the outside world. And if you've not heard this before, any idea how many sense receptors fire off in the human body each second? If you were to have a guess, what would your guess be? Thousands? Millions. They reckon I would love to know how they counted this, you know, I'd really love to know how they counted it. But they reckon we have 2.3 million sense receptors per second fire off in your body. 2.3 million sense receptors per second fire off in your body. We are gifted with the most phenomenal biochemical computer. You process more information faster than the biggest man-made computer does even now. We are just astonishing. Every time I teach this, I'm blown away by it. 2.3 million sense receptors per second. You ever feel tired? It's hardly surprising, is it? Bloody hell, what a second that was. I'm gonna have a sit down and a rest for a bit. 2.3 million sense receptors per second. Just shut this door. Now, there's some good news about this, and there's some less good news. So the good news is that the vast majority of that information, the vast majority of that processing goes on entirely outside of your awareness. So in NLP, we talk about your unconscious mind. It's your unconscious that does most of that stuff. You don't have to consciously think about it at all. It's your unconscious that deals with it. So uh, I, I do quite like driving analogies with NLP. So if, if you drive, do you ever do that thing where you get in your car 
and then the next thing you know, you're at your destination, and you've paid almost no attention to the journey. So it's almost like you get in the car and you say, take me to Preston. And as long as it's a familiar journey, you probably drive on automatic pilot. Yeah? You know that? Yeah? It's your unconscious mind that drives the car. It's, it's not your conscious mind. Your conscious mind sets the direction. Your unconscious mind does the driving. Because if you think about it, if you had to think consciously each time you had to make a movement when you're driving, it would be impossible, wouldn't it? It's like, oh, I have to consciously think about lifting my left foot up to put it on the clutch, to press it down, to move my arms, to change, all of that sort of thing. What we do as human beings is very naturally we engage in, in sort of programs of activity. So automatic, it's like automatic programs on a computer. And that's great, it's fabulous. Saves us having to think too much about stuff. It, it becomes a bit more tricksy when you're in an unfamiliar situation. So if you're used to driving in this country and you go abroad, you, you ever drive when on the wrong side of the road that they, they do it on the continent and then it's like, where's my handbrake gone? There's somebody stolen my handbrake. I can't find it because it's normally there. So if, uh, if we're doing something that's unfamiliar, then that unconscious programming becomes uh, like a bit more conscious. If you make a drink at home, you make a cup of tea, you probably don't have to think much about it, do you? It's automatic pilot. But if you go to somebody else's house and they say, uh, oh, help yourself to a brew, and then you're searching, I have, oh, put teaspoons in there. It's like, why would you do that? And, and what a daft place to... So there's something about in unfamiliar environments, we have to work a bit more consciously. But most of the time, it's our unconscious mind that does what we do. So that's the good news. That's fabulous good news. Less good news. The limits of our conscious awareness are actually quite small. So in mid-1950s, uh, there was a, a psychologist guy called George Miller did some quite famous research about uh, the, the sort of extent of our conscious awareness. And he talked about consciously we can manage, his phrase was seven plus or minus two, not individual sense receptors, but it's like chunks of things. So my notion is I can juggle seven plus or minus two balls at any one time. So I can manage between five and nine things at any one time. But if somebody throws one more into me, then I lose some of what was going on. And you might know that. You know, if, you, if you're busy and coping, so I've got a load on, I'm coping with it, and then somebody says, oh, can you just... And they throw one more ball in. And one of those things that I was paying attention to and managing okay, then it slips off the end. It's like I dropped that ball. Because consciously, I can't pay attention to everything. Consciously, we're quite limited. And what happens is we have filters that determine what comes to my conscious awareness and what's dealt with out of conscious awareness. And the filters are all sorts of things, all sorts of things. Uh, our beliefs are very strong filters on life. And this is a bit of a daft story, but I quite like it. And it's another driving one. So I used to know a guy called Ralph. We were sort of friends. We'd meet up now and again. And uh, we'd meet up, and very often Ralph would be late. And he'd say, uh, he'd come in, he'd say, oh, yeah, I'm sorry I'm late, Chris, sorry I'm late. He said, but wouldn't you know, every damn traffic light, every damn traffic light on the way here turned red as I approached. Every damn traffic light. And it was almost like Ralph had a belief that traffic lights had facial recognition software and held a grudge against him. And it was more, and I know we've all had journeys that feel a bit like that, but he carried it much more than that. It was like Ralph's belief was that traffic lights would turn red as he approached inevitably. Now, if you hold that as a belief, what do you think happens on those occasions when you sail through a traffic light and it remains on green? What happens to that? You don't pay attention to it. So you filter it out. So it'd be dealt with out of conscious awareness because the nature of our belief filters is what we look for and what we'll filter in consciously is stuff that fits my belief. And the traffic lights thing's a bit of daftness, but actually when you start bringing this two things that are a bit less daft, uh, when I worked at Calderstone, so I worked with people with learning disabilities, I often worked with people who could be a bit, a bit sort of lively, a bit tricksy. And very often people got admitted, and on their admission notes it would say something like so-and-so is violent and aggressive. Now, if somebody reads that, 
What do you think they're going to pay most attention to? Is it the 15 minutes in a day where that person's a bit boisterous? Or the 23 hours and 45 minutes when they're perfectly well behaved? What do you think? It's the 15 minutes in 10. Because what I do is I set my filter. Oh, he's violent and aggressive. So what I'll do is I'll set my filter for that. So this can be filters about other people, but it can also be the filters that we have about ourselves. So a few years ago, I was doing this course. We're doing the round of introductions. And there was a young woman sat somewhere, roughly where Sue's sitting there. And we get to her, and she said, um, she said, I hate doing this sort of thing. She said, I'm really shy, and I hate speaking in public. And she said it like that. And I thought, ooh. <laughs> and I thought, if that's shy, I don't want to see you being assertive or aggressive. Because if that's shy, it's like I don't want to see more than that. And I talked to her at a break time. I said, you know, by no reasonable sort of description would anybody judge your behavior as shy. Where do you get this thing from that you're shy? And she thought of it, and she said, um, oh, she said, my family all through my life, all through my childhood, told me that I was the shy one. And it's like what she'd done is like internalized that, almost like an identity. Does that make sense? So she felt some disc discomfort speaking in public, which many of us do. And then went, I'm shy. I must be shy. And actually, her behavior in the present moment wasn't shy at all. She was just remembering an old program, an old filter. Does that make sense to you as a notion? So what we pay attention to of other people and of ourselves, it isn't, it isn't present moment reality. It's our filtered versions of it. The other filters that we have, it's things like our preferences fit in there, things that are important to you fit in there. Uh, so yeah, you might know the experience. If you've ever changed your, the maker car that you drive, so you change the maker car that you drive, you probably have never really paid much attention to the, the new maker car, and then you buy one. And the roads are full of their damn things, aren't they? I bought a second-hand Skoda about six years ago, never seen them on the road before. The minute I bought it, there's hundreds of thousands of them on the road. Because what we do is we filter for the stuff that's important to us. If you're out and about and somebody says your name, you'll probably be there. You'll, uh, somebody said Chris, they must want me. If I'm walking around Burnley, somebody says Chris, I'm there. Because I am the only Chris in Burnley, aren't I? It's, uh, you know, I'm the only Chris. And then uh, women who have kids often say, it's like I'm out shopping, my kids are at home. But somebody says mum, I'm there, somebody wants a mother, here I am. I, uh, I am that mother, come to me. So what we take in from the outside world isn't the outside world. It's our particular filtered version of it. Yeah? And my notion of this is whatever you pay attention to consciously, this is, this is getting very technical now. You, you know you get PowerPoint on some courses. You come on hours, you get a torch and a rubber mat. That's how technical we get. My notion of this stuff is... Whatever we pay attention to consciously, it's like a torch beam in a darkened room. So whatever I shine my torch beam on is what I think's going on. That's what I think reality is. But actually, there's always more than that going on. Yeah? So I shine my torch beam on a particular part. That's what I think's going on. That's what I think reality is. But then if you have dealings with other people, their torch beam's going to be shining elsewhere. So it's like whatever you pay attention to, it isn't the whole of what's going on, it's just your filtered version of it. Does that make sense to you as an open?